So um, thanks so much for coming out this evening um, for this conversation with Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. Um, this is, event is sponsored by the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions, the Nicholas School for the Environment, um, the Keenan Institute for Ethics, and the Young Evangelicals for Climate Action. Um, and we're very excited to be able to have this conversation about climate and faith tonight. Um, before I introduce Catherine, I, I want to start with just a couple of personal remarks and, and say that for most of us, when we do our work or we think about what we want to do in this world, we align our values and our work. And for most of us, or maybe just for me, um, that alignment of values and work is something that I think people could have predicted. That um, when I became a vegetarian at age 14, my father probably would have told you, she's going to be an environmental attorney, uh, sort of a natural follow through of that alignment and values. And so I've done it in very much a culturally contextual way. And what's so interesting and what delights me so much about having this conversation with Dr. Hayhoe is that she has an alignment with her values and her work to have a meaningful life just like the rest of us but she's done it in a way that may not be the culturally contextual way that you would have anticipated and that intersection between two different cultural frameworks um, the science and the faith is something that uh, she does in a way that I think will be very engaging and hopefully informative and inspiring for all of us um, so a little bit about the, the framework for tonight. Dr. Hayhoe is going to speak to us for about 30 or 40 minutes. Um, and then we have a panelist of uh, Duke folks who have been thinking about climate from a variety of perspectives. And so we will each speak for a few minutes and then hopefully we'll open it up to a robust, robust dialogue amongst each other and with you. And um, when we're done talking, we can retire to the, the atrium area for drinks and further conversation. So with that, let me give uh, Dr. Heho an actual proper introduction um, and tell you her, her basic bio um, so that she can be set up for a robust conversation. She is an atmospheric science scientist who has focused on downscaled climate modeling. And so for those of you who are within the Nick School, I think you have a good sense of what that is. Um, and she, she, her PhD in atmospheric science came from the University of Illinois. Um, she has been engaged for a number of years now in bridging the science and faith gap, and she's done that in such a, a robust and appreciated and inspiring way that she was named Times, uh, one of Time's most 100 influential people. Um, and with that, I will let her fill in the very obvious gaps that I have left in her introduction and also get right to the conversation. Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you so much for that introduction and for the reflections that it included. So to really understand the perspective of a given community, we have to be an insider. We become an insider by being born into a community, by being educated within a community, or sometimes inadvertently by marrying into a community. I've done all three. I am a climate scientist. My degrees are in physics and atmospheric science. I've co-authored two national climate assessments and starting to work on the next one just the other day. I generate climate projections and evaluate climate models for the Department of Transportation, Fish and Wildlife Service, Department of Interior, EPA, all kinds of state agencies, cities, and other non-governmental organizations around the US and many others around the world. So I am intimately involved in the production of climate science, the evaluation of climate science, the application of climate science, and the defense of climate science. When you read about the climate scientists who were being attacked by organizations funded by coal companies, I was on that list. When you read about climate scientists who receive hate mail and attacks and threats, I'm on that list too. So I know what climate science is from the inside. But I am also from the faith community. I was born into a family whose faith was very important to them. My father was not only a science educator, but he was also a teacher in our local church. When I was nine years old, my family moved to Columbia to work as missionaries for a number of years with the local church. So I know evangelical Christianity because I am from that community too. 
But my community is from Canada, and Canada is quite a bit different than the U.S. So I inadvertently, without realizing it, married into a third community. I foolishly thought what you're like on one side of the border is what you're like on the other side of the border. It was six months after I married my husband, who has a PhD in applied linguistics. So he is no one's fool, but he came from a Republican family. His father was a Republican politician. He grew up south of the Mason-Dixon line. And it was six months after we married that we discovered we were on the opposite sides of the fence on climate change. You may ask, how on earth did that happen? What did you talk about? <laughs> we talked about a lot. The reason why we hadn't touched on climate change is because it never occurred to me, growing up in Canada, that any intelligent, educated person who understands data and science and publication and peer review would think that climate change wasn't real. And it never occurred to him growing up on the south side of the Mason-Dixon line that any Bible-believing Christian would think climate change was real. So there we were. So that's why, rather than talking about climate projections and how they can be used by everybody from grape growers in California to city planners in Austin, Texas, instead of talking about my research tonight, I'm going to be talking to you about my accidental second field of research which is entitled, I Don't Believe in Global Warming. I'm going to talk specifically about two things. They are the fact that about half the arguments I hear, and I kind of collect them on my Facebook page. I collect easily quite a few a day. In fact, sometimes I get a lot more than that a day. I got 15 the other day. If you categorize the arguments people have against the reality and the significance of climate change or against the necessity for action, they often either fall into a scientific perspective, the planet isn't warming, if it is, it's a natural cycle, even if it isn't, it's not a big deal, and so on and so forth, or they fall under more of a religious heading. God wouldn't let this happen, isn't it God's will anyways? God gave us fossil fuels, we should use them, etc. So often, we, I believe, make the mistake, this is the full picture, we make the mistake of taking these arguments at face value. But what I'm going to propose to you today is that both types of these arguments are smoke screens. They are smoke screens hiding the real reasons. But they are very successful smoke screens because if we do not discern that that is what they are, then we, like Don Quixote, are tilting at windmills. We, as climate scientists, are wasting all of our time saying, yes, climate is changing. No, the satellite record doesn't say it's cooling. Yes, the temperature data is accurate. We are spending all of our time repeating this again and again and again, whereas that is not the real objection. Or people in the faith community, and again, this is co-hosted by the Duke School of Divinity and by Young Evangelicals for Climate Action. Yes, Young Evangelicals for Climate Action do exist. I think that's awesome. <laughs> Or people in the faith community spend their life saying, no, it isn't God's will. Yes, humans do have the ability to change the planet. <clears throat> yes, there are sensible things we can do <coughs> compatible with Christian values. But again, if that's not the real issue, then we're tilting at windmills. So what am I talking about? Let me give you some examples. <clears throat> Last year, <coughs> I'm sorry, I might need a little bit of water. Thank you. <clears throat> Last year, for example, there was an editorial um, in the Washington Post talking about how climate science is not settled. We are very far from knowledge needed to make good climate policy. This is an example of saying we don't know enough yet. Now, if you look at the Wall Street Journal, according to the Union of Concerned Scientists, when they did the survey a couple of years ago, they found that 81% of information on their opinion page was misleading and 19% was accurate. So this already raises a bit of a red flag when you see the source. What is climate science? Climate science is not primarily statistics. There's this idea that we just take carbon dioxide temperature, correlate them, and make them go up. That's not what climate models are. Climate models are based on physics. In fact, the first climate model was just a thought experiment. Hey, if we put nonlinear fluid dynamics into one of these fancy new computers, this was back in the 1950s, if we just put physics in, what do we get? Well, it turns out you get the exact circulation patterns of the atmosphere for the special case of a fluid on a rotating sphere. It's physics. And when you look at it, 
This is what it looks like. Because of the solid basis of climate science in physics that dates back almost 200 years, the situation we have today is that even though the public thinks, 55% of the public thinks that the science is unsettled or don't know. But in the scientific community, it's over 97% and it has been for well over a decade. What settled science is this? Well, it's pretty basic. When you burn coal, gas, and oil, produces carbon dioxide, right? We know how much of the stuff we've been producing. We know the radiative properties of carbon dioxide. We know literally the wavelengths at which it vibrates and rotates. We know those are in the atmospheric window. We know that it traps heat that would otherwise escape to space. Just like a blanket traps our body heat on a cold night, in the same way, these heat trapping gases trap the Earth's heat on a cold night. And what happens when, as my grandma always did, she sneaks into the room and she puts an extra blanket on you, you start to sweat. That's what we're doing to our planet. It already has the perfect natural blanket that keeps us almost 60 degrees Fahrenheit than we would be otherwise. But we have snuck up and wrapped an extra blanket around our planet that it didn't need. And that's why the planet is warming. If you look from year to year, you know, one year might be colder, one year might be warmer. But over climate time scales of 10, 20, 30, 40 years, the planet is warming. And if you look farther back in time, if you look at the ice age cycles, both carbon dioxide on the top and temperature on the bottom, you see that we are out of the ballpark when it comes to the natural blanket that we have been used to over the course of human civilization. And according to these ice age cycles, we should be heading into the next ice age, and we are not. We are getting warmer and warmer, faster and faster. We've known this for a really long time. We've known about the natural blanket since Fourier in the early 1800s, the same guy who did the Fourier time series. We've known that coal mining and other fossil fuel activity produces heat trapping <laughs> gases since the days of Tyndale in the 1850s. The man in the middle, Arrhenius, is my personal hero because he was the first climate modeler. From basic physics, he constructed and calculated the climate model by hand. He calculated how much the Earth would warm if we doubled or tripled carbon dioxide levels. He calculated how much warmer the Arctic would be than the rest of the world, and he was pretty much right. And he did it all, like I said, using basic physics by hand. It took him <coughs> two years. And somewhere around about the second Christmas, his wife left him. She packed up the family and left. <laughs> this is very personal to me because this is what I do, but nowadays we have supercomputers. So I set up the simulation, I push the button, and I go have dinner. It works. What else do we know? We know that today, I don't know if you saw The Years of Living Dangerously, but if you haven't, I recommend it. It's on Amazon Video or iTunes. We know that the impacts are here today and they're affecting real people. There's a human face we can put on this issue today. And we know that our choices matter. Depending on whether we follow a business as usual pathway, we continue to depend on fossil fuels for most of our energy, we're going to see continued rapid change. But if we can transition in a sensible way to non-carbon emitting sources of energy, then we're going to see a much slower rate of change that we might be able to adapt to more successfully. This is what we know. Are there things we don't know in climate science? Tons of things. What do we not know? How are tiny, minute little cloud particles going to respond in giant global climate models? What is happening up in the Arctic when all the methane trapped in the continental shelf under the ocean becomes destabilized in a warmer atmosphere? What's going to happen to major ecosystems like the Amazon? when rainfall patterns change? These are huge questions that remain to be answered. But do we know that climate is changing? Yes. Do we know that humans are responsible? We do, because if it weren't for us, we'd be cooling right now. Do we know that our choices determine future impacts? Absolutely. We know that the future is in our hands. So sure, there's always going to be science that isn't settled, because the planet is as complex as the human body. There's always something new to learn, but there is nothing new to learn 
about why our planet is changing. The number one cause today is us. So, what do we do with this information? I work in a political science department, and my colleagues, even though they live in West Texas, are very accepting of the science of climate change. But a couple months ago, my program director came to me, and he said, in a very well-meaning way, he said, you know, Catherine, if you could just speak with your colleagues, if you could tell them not to be so alarmist, because it really does your profession a disfavor to be constantly over-exaggerating the risks of climate change. I think people would believe you more if you just toned it down a little bit. It was very well-meaning that he said that. But what I love about social science is you can actually test hypotheses. And this is what a group of colleagues did. A paper that was led by Naomi Oreskes, who some of you might know from Merchants of Doubt, Michael Oppenheimer, a colleague of mine, a climate scientist, and several other colleagues, they wrote a paper. And they started off by saying in their abstract, I like to show pictures so you know who actually said this. This is Naomi. Skeptics of the reality and significance of human-induced climate change have frequently accused climate scientists of being an alarmist. So what they did was they took 20 years worth of projections that were made a while back, and so we had 20 years of data to see if they were true or not. And they said, okay, if we're alarmist, what are we going to see? we're going to see a systematic overestimation of the actual change. What did they find? The opposite. They found that scientists were biased. So yes, scientists are biased. But we're biased in terms of being very conservative. In fact, they found we're so biased that they coined a syndrome and they said that we are subject to ESLD, erring on the side of less rather than more drama. So rather than exaggerating the science, scientists have toned it down because we hate being called alarmist. We hate it. But what I've realized is, is that to avoid being called alarmist, there's only one way to avoid it. The way to avoid it is to stop talking about climate change entirely. Because as long as we stand up in any public forum of any kind and say climate is changing, humans are responsible, the impacts are real, and we have choices to make, we will be called alarmist. So people may say the science is not settled, but what I love is this companion article that came out from my colleague Ray Pierre Humbert from the University of Chicago. He went through every single argument, and he showed exhaustively and comprehensively how enough science is settled to know that we have a problem, that it is real, and that we do have choices to make. So that is a smokescreen. It does not have a basis on which to stand. But there's another class of arguments that we hear. And last year, about this time, I was asked to come to Boston College, which is a Jesuit university, and I was given this title. Usually people don't give you your title, but they gave me this title. They wanted me to speak on religion and the roots of climate change denial. So I said to them, there's a little problem. I don't actually think the roots are in religion. They said, that's OK. You can say that. You just have to use the title. <laughs> yeah. I did pick the title today, in case anybody's wondering. So I said, OK. I understand why we think the roots are in religion. And you do too if you follow the news. You can, for example, watch a US senator cite the Bible to prove that humans aren't causing global warming. You can go and find quotes from elected officials saying things like, the climate of the globe has been fluctuating ever since God created it, so in the beginning. Then, today, our climate will continue to change because of the way God formed the earth. And then, in the future, you see we're covering the whole time span here, in the future, the earth will end only when God declares it is time to be over. Man will not destroy this earth. I feel personally very relieved women are not part of the destruction of the earth. <laughs> and then, of course, we hear many statements 
along the lines of it being a hoax. The arrogance of people to assume that we, puny little human beings, would be able to change what God is doing to climate is outrageous. So is there reason to think that the roots of climate denial lies in religion? Yeah, there definitely is. And when you look at surveys, this Pew survey came out in 2008, so eight years ago. They asked people, is there solid evidence the Earth is warming? The green is yes, because of human activity. And what do we see? You have total US population, then you have people unaffiliated with any church, their numbers are the biggest. Then you have white mainline Protestants, about the same as the average, and then you have white Catholics, then you have white evangelical Protestants. So often we make the mistake of assuming that a correlation implies causality. And more recent data continues to show a similar breakdown. This is a, a public religion a study that came out a year and a half ago that asked how concerned are you about climate change. You use slightly different denominations, but you can see that you have all Americans at the top, and then you have, actually, the most concerned group is who? Hispanic Catholics. It's the number one most concerned group. But then you go down the list and you have, you know, uh, non-Christian religions, then you have Jewish, then you have white mainline Protestant, white evangelical Protestant, white Catholic. Most unconcerned people, apparently, in America are white Catholics. Now, this was just before the post encyclical came out, if anybody was wondering. They wanted to do this before, not after. So there are certainly reasons to believe that this is the source. But here comes social science again. And John Evans here, sociologist from UC San Diego, studied conservatism, Protestantism, and skepticism of scientists. A lot of isms there. What he found was, and again, this is quoting directly from his paper, Compared to the not actively religious, fundamentalist Protestants are less likely to believe the conclusiveness of climate science. Yeah, we know that. We just saw the data. But here's the beauty of social science. Controlling for demographic properties showed that it's not go where you go on a Sunday that determines your opinion about climate change. Turns out opinions are rooted in age, political conservatism, and where we fall on the political spectrum. Because if you look not just at people as Democrat or Republican, one side or the other, if you look across the spectrum, the more conservative people are, the more skeptical they are about climate change. So in other words, Tea Party is more skeptical than the average Republican. How does this connect with religion? because 75% of those who identify with the Tea Party describe themselves as a Christian conservative. And when you actually divide out the Tea Party by denomination, 44% is white evangelical. Then you have white mainline and Catholic. How else do we know that Christianity specifically is not the root of climate denial? There's one other way to do it and that is to actually go to the Bible. If you go to the Bible, there is no verse saying climate change is real and you better do something about it. <laughs> yes, there is no verse and there is no lost book, I think, that will be discovered that says that. But there are plenty of verses that talk about attitudes and actions that people who believe the Bible are supposed to have, beginning in the very first book of the Bible where it says that God made people in his image for a specific reason, and that reason is to be responsible for every living thing on the face of the earth. That's where the idea of stewardship or caretaking comes from. Responsibility, taking care of. Then, in the New Testament, it talks about how people who believe the Bible are to be recognized by their love for others. And as an insider in the community, I could say, that would be a really amazing thing if that was what Christians were recognized for. But that is what we're supposed to be recognized for. And we have a lot of signs in Texas, and this is one sign that I do like. I don't know why God only puts signs up in Texas, but <laughs> <laughs> apparently he does. I like this sign. That I love thy neighbor thing, I meant it. And then if we go all the way through to Revelation, there's a, a verse in Revelation saying God will destroy those who destroy the earth. It's kind of a nice trifecta there. How does this connect to Christianity? It connects to Christianity because when we look at who is most vulnerable to a changing climate, 
This is what the map of the world looks like. Where do these people live? They live in the countries where people are already poor. They lack access to sufficient food, clean water, basic health care, a safe environment, education, justice, opportunities for women. All of these issues where our hearts are already engaged, and often our pocketbooks are too. So there's a direct connection between issues that many Christians already care about and the issue of climate change. There is a real human face, whether it is a heat wave in India, whether it is a drought in Africa, whether it is a flood in Texas. Now let me just clarify here. Before climate was changing, before climate was warming due to human activities, were there heat waves in India? Yes, there definitely were. What's different now? They last longer and they are stronger. Before climate change, were there droughts in Africa? Of course. What's different now? In a warmer environment, water evaporates more quickly from the soil, so the droughts accelerate and get stronger and last longer. Before climate was changing due to human activity, were there floods in Texas? You get where I'm going here, right? Answer is yes, of course. But in a warmer atmosphere, more water evaporates, so when a storm comes along, there's more water for the storm to pick up and dump. And faith leaders and Christian leaders get this. The Pope gets it. He connects the issue of climate change directly to its impact on the poor. The U.S. National Association of Evangelicals gets it. They put out a report three years ago talking about loving the least of these, climate change and the poor. So leaders in the community get it. Among the leadership in the faith community, there is very consistent messaging, even among evangelicals. Now, I'm not saying everybody's on the same page, but I'm saying that most of the biggest organizations have some pretty good statements out there, whether you're talking about World Vision or, again, the National Association of Evangelicals. So what really is going on then? If it isn't the real reason, if religion is a smokescreen, what is going on? Well, to figure out what's going on, let's go back and let's look at a different quote now. This quote was made in the same year as the previous quote I showed you about the arrogance of humans to think that we could affect something as big as this planet. In the same year, Jim Inhofe was on Rachel Maddow and he said this to her. He said, do you realize I was actually on your side of this issue when I was chairing that Senate Environment Committee and I first heard about it? I was on your side. He says, I thought it must be true until when? Until I found there was scientific data saying that it wasn't? No. Until I opened the Bible and it said that climate change wasn't real? No. I thought it must be true until I found out how much it would cost. And therein lies the roots of climate denial. To put it a different way, it isn't just about money. Do not make the mistake of thinking it is just about money. Money certainly plays a role, but there is more to it than that. And so the vice president of the National Association of Evangelicals, a guy called Gal Galen Carey, he gets it right. He says, Many evangelicals oppose actions to slow climate change, not on a religious basis, and he would know, but politically because they believe the government wants to take away their freedom. And if we get to the point where we are having honest, genuine exchanges with people who are not on the same page as us on, as on climate science, which I am fortunate enough I usually think of it this way. I'm fortunate enough to have on a pretty regular basis living in Texas. If we have those honest, genuine, open conversations, nine times out of 10, we will get to the point where issues like this come up and then we really are talking about the real issue. Last year, I was speaking to a group of water managers in South Texas. Water managers know that something is going on because they run the data and they see that Texas has always had drought and flood, drought and flood. But nowadays we're seeing drought and flood, drought and flood, drought and flood. So they're getting worried about it. So I was talking to water managers about the past, 
we're all on the same page there. About the future, we're on the same page there. Or about the present. And then the future, things started to get a little iffy, but they were coming along with me, and we kind of ended up in the same place. We were good. So at the end of my presentation, an older gentleman stood up at the back, and he said, very honestly, he said, you know, I wasn't really sure about this whole thing, but everything you said made sense. Here's my problem. I don't want the government telling me how to set my thermostat. Therein lies the roots of climate denial. Because honestly, who does want the government telling them how to set their thermostat, right? I said, you know, I am with you. I don't want that either. But we have been told repeatedly that you have to be a certain type of person and that there are only certain types of solutions. And that's why it's so important to involve all the voices from across the political spectrum to talk about solutions, because that is not science. That is politics. And there is no perfect solution. There is definitely the best compromise, but there is no silver bullet. There is no, yes, this is the right thing to do. So in the last few minutes here, before we go on to get our opinions about this, I want to end with a bit of hope. Because at this point, you're kind of saying, what's the point? Where do we go from here? I mean, if this is really the issue, how do we build a bridge across this chasm that gets deeper and wider every year? Well, as a scientist and as an educator, we often assume people need more information. If we just present people with more information, if we write the correct information on the blank slates of people's minds, then people will change their opinion. Again, social science comes to our assistance. And Dan Cahan published a paper a couple years ago. He said, public apathy over climate change is often attributed to a lack of comprehension. People don't know enough science. So if it's true, then what would be our logical response in the face of the situation we find ourselves in today? What should we do as scientists? We should, yes, let's write another report. <laughs> so the IPCC report started in 1990, but that was a long time ago. So they followed them up after a few years with a new set, and then in 95 they released a whole new set. But that was 95. You need another new set in the 2000s, and then 2005, and then last year they put out another new set. But maybe those didn't work because they're international reports. Maybe we need a national assessment, or a second national assessment, or a third national assessment, or the fourth national assessment, which is coming soon. But those are government reports. Maybe those didn't work because they're federal government. Maybe we need a National Academy of Sciences report, or another National Academy report, or another one. That's our response if we think that more facts will change people's minds. But the reality, what Dan and his team found, I love this statement, it's so beautiful. We conducted a study to test this account and we found no support for it. Rather, and this is really bizarre, not so bizarre when you think about it, but for those of us who educate for a living, it seems bizarre. People who were most literate on science were most polarized on the issue. So he concluded, and here we have a picture of Dan, that public division does not come from incomprehension. It comes from the fact that we have personal interest in keeping in with our friends and community. And I've had people say this to me. I was at a small Wesleyan college last year that just put in the biggest solar array of any institution in New York, of any educational institution. Yet at that university with a sustainability office with a very progressive president with an environmental impact statement at that university, a student confided in me that he can't tell his friends he thinks climate change is real because they would ostracize him. We live in an increasingly polarized society and we live in these tribes. And what is more important to us is not facts, it's what our tribe believes to be true because that is who we are. So at the bottom of climate denial is this strong belief that may be not even voiced to our consciousness in our head, that I cannot be who I am and agree that climate change is real. It threatens my identity, and we will fight for our identity. How do we move forward? We move forward by building these bridges. 
And when we build these bridges, we have to recognize that we are not divided into just two camps on this issue. It's not black and white, yes and no. This is the Six Americas of Global Warming by Tony Lazarowitz and Ed Maybach. And they have done this market, seg market segmentation for quite a number of years now. Now these categories, the numbers in the categories vary by a few percent from year to year. But the biggest thing here to notice is that the loudest voices that we hear on climate change come from the smallest groups. Okay, except for the disengaged. So we hear alarmed voices in the media. Why? Because the media wants strong statements. They want people saying things with exclamation marks on the bottom. So you hear lots of alarm statements in the media, but you also hear lots of dismissive statements because they're strong, they're polarized, they set up this argument. People get hooked, like, oh, I want to read about that. But guess what? Those are the smallest groups. Many more people are concerned, cautious, or even doubtful. And so that is where we can build the bridges and talk. How do we do that? What types of things do we do? Very briefly, I want to propose something to you. I think that the first thing we can do is, and this is a strange thing to say as a scientist, we can recognize that our response to the reality of climate change comes more from here than it does from here. So if we are going to talk to somebody about climate change, rather than pulling out a scientific report or pulling out a stack of data and shoving it at them, which often prompts them to do the same thing to us, what if we connected from here first in a genuine way? Not manufacturing something that we didn't really care about, but we're pretending to, but actually looking at ourselves and thinking, what do I care about? What am I passionate about? What community do I come from? What do I value? And how can I connect and bond with somebody else who has that same value as I do, but might not be in the same category here as I am? What am I talking about? I'm talking about almost anything. Just to give you a couple of examples. Um, this is me. I used to fish. I used to fish all the time. I caught and released. Sometimes I would catch the fish multiple times. But if you are a outdoors person, if you are a hunter, if you are a birder, if you are a fisherman or woman, that is a great way to connect with people in a genuine way who might not be on the same page about climate change. Tell you what, if you're a skier, you have every reason in the world to care about climate change because our seasons are getting way unpredictable and we're losing out often on the biggest season around Christmas. If we're a parent, we care about climate change. And tomorrow at the Science Museum, we're having a panel with the Moms Clean Air Force to talk about climate change, health, and our kids. That's at noon if you want to come. It's a free event. I spoke to the Rotarian Club last year and Luckily, I had about half an hour between when I arrived and when I had to speak. So I saw their banner hanging there with the four-way test, and I thought, oh my goodness, this is climate change. Is it true? Yes. Is it fair? No. Would it build goodwill to do something about it? Yeah. And would it be beneficial to do something about it? Yes, absolutely. So I took my presentation quick as I could. I restructured it around the four-way test. And then I'm giving this to a bunch of business people from Lubbock, where I know 90% of people in the room didn't think this was real, and they're all giving the woman who invited me really dirty looks when they thought I couldn't see. <laughs> At the end of it, a man came up to me and said, you know, he said, I am just skeptical about this whole thing, but it passed the four-way test. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yes. And here's one of the biggest ways we can connect. That is through faith communities. Because over 80% of people in the United States belong to a faith community. And for those who do belong, that is often where many of our values come from. Now, if you do not, this is not the area for you to connect. Last year, I was at a Christian college up in Canada. And after I, talk, I was speaking to the college and the community, a fellow colleague, a scientist, came up to me and he said, I really want to be doing this. I've been trying to plug into churches in inner British Columbia, which is a very conservative area. I've been trying to plug in there for like a year and I, I can't even get my foot in the door. So I said to him, well, you have to start with your own denomination. You have to start with your own family. What's your denomination? He said, I'm an atheist. <laughs> I said, well, that is not who you should be talking to then. Now this is interesting because we as scientists are taught to be very impersonal, right? But what I'm saying now is to talk to people about climate change, we have to recognize we are human. 
We have to look at our heart. We have to see what makes us human, what makes us tick, what makes us passionate, what makes us excited, what makes us fearful, what makes us love. And we have to genuinely connect with other human beings over that, not this. And for scientists, that is a bit scary sometimes. Then we can connect to the issue of climate change. You know, I am a skier and gosh, last time I showed up, there was just bare snow or bare ground everywhere. I'm a parent and did you know that climate change puts our kids' health at risk? Um, I have a cousin in the military. Thankfully, he got back safely from his tour of duty, but did you know that the Department of Defense calls climate change a threat multiplier? I'm concerned about the economy. Did you know that Michael Bloomberg has actually quantified the economic risks of climate change. And he's not a scientist, but he definitely knows business. Did you know that here in Texas, our droughts are getting stronger and longer? Did you know that the Pope said this? Did you know that the National Association of Evangelicals said that? Connect it. Only then, only then, do the explaining if you need to. It's real, it's us, scientists agree, and it matters. If you need answers to scientific questions, skeptical science has them, and they have links to the original scientific journal articles, too. I kind of use them as a reference search sometimes. They have it all nicely collated. But that isn't all the explaining. We can also explain why it matters if we live in the East, why it, where storms are, coastal storms are getting stronger, why it matters in the West, where pine beetles are eating millions of acres of forest, why it matters in the North, where over 300 Native American villages are at imminent risk due to melting ground and coastal erosion. In the south, where increase of flood causes loss of livelihood and life. But we don't end there. There's one more step we have to take. Because again, the social science tells us that if we don't offer a solution when we talk about a problem, our human acceptance of the reality of the problem is like this. If we offer a solution, our acceptance is like this. I haven't figured out how to put air bars on when I use my hands. <laughs> you have to picture the whiskers. <laughs> how can we, now remember what Galen Carey said about people being objecting to climate change because the solutions take away our liberties? How can we work together to solve this problem in a way that is compatible with our values? How can we work together in hope? We can inspire with the progress we've already made in Texas. They're breaking record after, after record. We already generate almost 20% of our electricity from wind on a regular basis. On really windy days, it's more like 40% in Texas. Isn't that crazy? It's pretty cool. In the Netherlands, they're putting in a solar bike path. Tesla 3 just came out. I really want one. There's practical things we can do. A carbon calculator to just measure our carbon footprint. Everybody can do it. It's painless and it's free. There's awesome organizations, even faith-based organizations like climate caretakers, where you sign up and they send you something every month that you can do. And then they add up all our activities together and they say, wow, here's the impact that we actually accomplish together. Because so often we feel alone and isolated. We can even talk about it. This is from that same survey of, of denominations. Who talks about climate change? Hispanic Catholics, between often and sometimes, they talk about it 70% of the time, often or sometimes. That's a lot. Look at other one, white mainland Protestant, white evangelical, white Catholic. Ooh, those numbers are pretty low. They just don't talk about it. We can encourage people to act, whether it's working with our church community, working with our uni university community. We can do things. And lastly, we can actually make our voices heard. And so that's one of, why one of the organizations that I volunteer with is Citizens Climate Lobby, because it's a true bipartisan organization. They actually have Republicans and they have Democrats who agree that putting a price on carbon and refunding the money to people through their taxes is a great way to allow the free market to fix our carbon problem. That's pretty cool. The bottom line, though, is this. And you've probably seen this cartoon, right? What if the whole thing is a big hoax and we created a better world for nothing? Even if we don't agree that climate is changing due to human activities, you know what? I think we can often agree on solutions. 
We can agree that investing in solar energy in North Carolina creates more jobs per megawatt hour than investing in fossil fuels. We can agree that ultimately we won't have enough fossil fuels, but we'll always have enough sun as long as there's humans on this planet. We can agree that getting our fuel from inside the country versus from other sides of the country that aren't very friendly is probably a better thing to do. And so I want to close with a quote from one of my favorite scientists, Jane Goodall, who said something very profound. When asked why she named her chimpanzees, she said, it's because only when our clever brain and our human heart work together in harmony are we as humans and scientists able to achieve our full potential. Thank you. Okay, can everybody hear me? <laughs> um, so thank you so much for that. If I think what we'll do now is each of us will take a few minutes to both introduce ourselves and to give a few remarks both on what Catherine says and our, has said in our own research, and then we will open it up to have a conversation um, with y'all. So I think, great. Megan, if you want to go first. We're going to start the microphone. Can you slide that down, or should I just can you hold it down a bit? Let's see. <laughs> Hi, I'm Megan Mullen. Um, can you all hear me? This way. Okay, great. Um, I'm an associate professor of environmental politics here at the Nicholas School, um, and I have to start by thanking Dr. Hayhoe for the really compelling talk, and and to tell you that it is so refreshing to hear a scientist who engages with social science. And does it knowledgeably and with respect <laughs> and even acknowledge that we test hypotheses in social science. So that was, you put me in a good mood and I have only lovely things to say. <laughs> See, now a little flattery. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I felt like I was being flattered with them. Um, well, you should be. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, this afternoon we were, we were talking before we came in, um, and someone asked Dr. Heho, what's the biggest obstacle to talking about climate change? When you go out to these, you didn't talk about your research, but she goes out to communities, to localities, to states, to non-governmental organizations, and helps them grapple with the pending consequences of, of climate change or the, or the existing consequences of climate change for their communities. And so somebody asked, what's the biggest obstacle when you talk to these local leaders about climate change? Um, and she answered, I'm going to say publicly, Al Gore. <laughs> um, and, and I think her talk illustrated why. And so I just want to give you, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about public opinion about climate change. Um, and just want to give you a little bit more of the context around some of what she said which is that you know, there are a lot of researchers um, in my field who are trying to understand where the public is on climate change, the American public in particular, um, and how maybe we can move public opinion on climate change. Um, and the, the things that they're thinking, the way they're measuring public opinion, the way they're thinking about public opinion um, is around belief, Right? Belief that this is happening and that it's human caused. Around concern, how much do you care? And around support for different kinds of policies to do something about climate change. Um, and across the board, what we see in responses, in, in surveys, um, is the sort of polarized trends that Dr. Heho talked about. Um, over the last particularly 25 years, starting around 1990, um, a public that was sort of all together on climate change has moved in opposite directions, with Republicans and self-identified conservatives becoming less and less believing, less concerned, and less supportive of public policy, and Democrats and self-identified liberals moving in the opposite direction. Um, but it's important to differentiate these three things, right? So there's belief. And, and that follows the pattern that I just talked about. But there's also concern. And among both groups, 
except for the people at the two ends of your six Americas. For the other four groups, which made up about 80% of the public, concern is very low. People are not viewing this as a fundamental challenge facing the country, facing the planet, either now or in the future. And so it follows that polarization, but for, for the mass, whichever side you fall on for belief, we're not adequately concerned to do something about it and to put to appeal to policymakers to do something about it. And that brings me to policy response, which um, responses to those questions are all over the map. And the reason they're all over the map is because it depends on how you ask the question. Are you going to indicate that there might be a tax? Are you going to indicate that there might be regulatory activity that goes along with it? Or are you going to say something benign in your question, like, should we do something to control carbon emissions? Sure, you get overwhelming support for that kind of question. But the, the, as, to, as you said in your talk, we have choices to make. And these choices could potentially be costly. And the choices do involve redistribution of resources. The choices do involve government regulation of activities that, that government has not regulated as actively in the past. And these, these tap into our values and they're important conversations to have. And they're conversations we should be having rather than is the science real or not, right? Which is a well, you know, that's not the conversation we should be having because there are really important questions about what we do about it. Um, and so I just want to I just want to finish up by saying I have sort of two more solutions in addition to the solutions that you offered at the end of your talk. Um, and one of my solutions is you talked a lot about sort of the mass public, right, and how we all engage and are thinking about these things. Well, I want to talk about pressuring elites, right, because we know from political science research about a whole lot of other issues. If you have elites that are polarized and giving two different messages about an issue, the public will follow those elites. And so we need to pressure elites, not just get the public to move, we need elites to help move too, right? So that's, that's one, and the way we pressure elites is through voting, is through getting the 80% to be more concerned whether or not um, this is, you know, wherever they are in belief. And the second is to take advantage of the policy activity that is happening, right? So we do have states and localities that are starting to act in the absence of federal action, and they're doing it to protect their communities, they're doing it um, to enhance renewables industries, they're doing it for a whole variety of different reasons. And the other thing that we know from political science research is that policies can move opinions. We saw it in Social Security. You have a policy that creates a new constituency. You see it in um, charter schools, right? You have policies that create constituencies that demand more policy activity. And so support these local policy efforts because they're building constituencies, right, that could help start to see these multiple benefits um, from climate change policy action and also potentially show that the risks of that policy activity are not quite so high as some, as some people might imagine. Thanks. So I'm Amy Pickle. I direct the state policy program at the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions, and which is perhaps the longest title ever in the creation of titles. Um, so my role is to work with decision makers, both private and public, to come up and craft policy solutions to some of the most thorny environmental problems. Um, and climate is certainly the wickedest of the wicked problems that we talk about. So. In that role, I'm working with decision makers on a regular basis and figuring out how to enter into that dialogue on climate is what I do on a regular basis. So hearing a conversation about talking from my heart to a, a decision maker is a little bit challenging because that's not where, um, that's not my job to talk to. <laughs> 
<laughs> so let me um, start by telling you a little anecdote about some of the work that we've done. So in, in 2010, um, we were working on decision making in North Carolina around climate change on the coast. And for those of you who are engaged in issues in North Carolina, you realize that that is one of the real um, front lines for this dialogue around climate change, particularly around sea level rise and direct climate impacts. And we had pulled together the best science that was available at the time as to the impacts. And we had decided, I think somewhat along the same lines as your work, that the folks who are feeling the impact the most, the decision makers who are having to make decisions immediately are local governments. And so we gathered up this information about their, their jurisdiction, um, information about their underlying natural assets and the threat to those natural assets, the economic value that those natural assets brought. Um, and we went and we talked to both the planners, the folks who do that on the line work to incorporate climate change into their local land use plans, as well as talking to the elected officials. And what the responses that we got, I think, are very indicative of the range of responses that uh, decision makers give whenever you start to engage in this issue. One of them, in one of the wealthier areas of the coast of North Carolina, their response was to immediately engage, and I'm going to steal your word, in the smoke screens. Immediately engage in, you, I think one of the quotes from one of the electeds was something along the lines of, if you get to cherry pick your science, so do I. That we are entering into another ice age, that climate is naturally variable, that the evidence that um, you're relying on in your presentation isn't real. Now, this is particularly interesting because we had scrubbed our presentation from any mention of climate change at all. We talked about how um, local governments need to make decisions about where they locate their water intakes in light of a saltwater wedge that is creeping up in the coast that's exacerbated both by the um, overpumping of the aquifer and the um, sort of natural hydrology of North Carolina's coast. We talked about coastal erosion, which has been happening since North Carolina had a coast, um, and the impacts on local governments and Oceanside. We talked about primary nursery areas and the impact from water quality. Um, we talked about land use decisions, where you build schools and your institutions and what that infrastructure is going to do. We did not use the phrase climate change once, and we did it on purpose, and we did it because what we wanted to talk about were the decisions that they were making and the environmental context that they were making that decision in. So, Immediately in that presentation was the conversation about climate change, to which we responded, we, are, we want to talk about impacts and we want to be able to provide you with help and information about how to um, build a stronger, more economically resilient, more disaster resilient community. Um, and we were only thankful that the conversation was cut off because uh, folks from the census needed to speak next, um, and we had sort of softened the blow. If you can imagine how um, we were received, the folks from the Census Bureau were even less well received. Um, so I think that immediate response to engage in climate, even when those words aren't used, indicates where policymakers are in talking about environmental impacts generally. The other response that we received was um, from local governments who are, were some of the poorest counties that we have in North Carolina. And their response was not disbelief. It was not to engage on the science. Their response was, what do you want us to do? We have no resources. We don't have an ability to, to affect climate change on a mitigation on a mitigation level, and we don't have the ability to adapt. They didn't use those either of those words. So they don't have the resources to engage in adaptation mechanisms. They don't have the ability, the financial ability within their communities to address some of these environmental impacts. And I think, you know, through the course of that work and others, and we could we can talk about any number of examples. I want to leave y'all with a few things to think about when you're engaging the decision maker section of the elites. So the first is that 
decision makers respond to immediate and fixable problems. So Miami floods regularly. The flooding in Miami is increasing all the time. The Broward County, da Dade County, Miami area has one of the few local government climate action plans in the country. And they do it because they're flooding and there's an immediate and fixable problem. Now we can discuss whether or not that their solutions are for a long term, are they going to be able to adjust to the increasing variability in climate, um, or is their solution robust enough? Um, but nevertheless, they are working forward, on, or looking forward to fix a problem that is impacting them right now. So decision makers need that sort of time uh, sensitive problem, and they also need it to be fixable. So they need something to be able to do. So to come to people and decision makers in particular and say, we need to do something about climate. It's a global problem and um, there's a collective action issue and a tragedy of the commons issue. And if you could just impose a carbon tax, that would be great. Um, that's not the, gonna be a response that is going to engage decision makers and meet them where they're at. So that's, that's one. Um, the second is that I think the economy is the great broker here between the various uh, positions on the science and on the potential solutions. In other words, everybody wants to be a pragmatist when you're a decision maker. You want to um, have clean energy jobs and you want to have a cleaner environment. There's actually no decision maker out there, um, and I work with folks of all political stripes, who says, I would like dirty air, no jobs, and bad water. That would be awesome. That's really what, I, that's why I go into public service, um, is to be, really to, to run down our planet. And so the, the linkage the easiest way to start a conversation is often around um, the economy. So economics, uh, economics is, is the great pragmatist. Um, and I, I sort of want to go back and, and reflect on folks who do a lot of lobbying and who work with decision makers. I'm not a lobbyist. Um, but I, I talk to a lot of lobbyists. I have a lot of friends who are lobbyists. Um, and one of the things that they will often say as they talk um, about their work and what they do to relate to decision makers is that figuring out the why of your decision maker is key to understanding um, how to talk to them about a wide range of issues, climate change or anything else. And this goes to this idea of speaking to the heart and how do you speak to the heart um, of decision makers in a very uh, real world sense. And I wanna go, I also wanna quote uh, Dan uh, Kahan, who is the, with the Cultural Cognition Project at Yale Law School. And, and he has said this great quote of, um, what you believe about climate change doesn't reflect what you know. It, refl it expresses who you are. So if your job is to influence or talk to decision makers, understanding who they are is the context in which you can have a conversation about solutions. Um, and I'll stop talking now and turn it over to David. <laughs> okay. I'm David Toole. I um, run the undergraduate uh, program in global health here. I also sit in the Divinity School and occasionally teach classes on theology, and I teach ethics courses for the Kin Institute for Ethics. Um, I think I'm here tonight um, definitely not to talk about policy or politics. I think I'm probably supposed to talk about theology <clears throat> or something to do with religion and climate change. <clears throat> but I also know when to get out of the way. Um, uh, and um, I think, so I'm going to be very brief, or if I'm not, then somebody should grab the microphone. Uh, because I do think that you would really benefit a lot more from talking to Catherine than me for um, the next few minutes. So just a few reflections. Uh, I'm a newcomer to the conversation. I, I got involved in the conversation this summer with Amy and some others at Duke after Pope Francis published his encyclical on climate change. Of course, it was on many other things, but that's sort of how it got billed. And that um, got me into the conversation, uh, but um, I'm very much an outsider overall to, um, to the conversation. Uh, but the little bit I've reflected on it um, and thinking about this panel, I, I've been wondering like what the issue is theologically with climate change. Like who could possibly marshal theological arguments against the reality of climate change? 
And um, so I asked uh, Catherine um, earlier, uh, so when you're in these little towns in Texas and you run into arguments against climate change, I mean, what are they saying? And this is when she said, well, it's Al Gore is the problem. I mean, it's actually not theology, it's Al Gore, because God forbid that anybody align themselves with Al Gore. Uh, so then you saw in her presentation, if they do make theological arguments or attempt to make them against climate change, they're pretty thin. Well, God made a world in which things are always changing. True enough. Um, hardly an argument against the realities of what we're seeing. Or um, human beings couldn't possibly destroy what God has made. Um, Clearly, these are people who have not read the Bible, because as I read the Bible, the Bible is one long story about God getting pissed off about the extent to which we're always destroying what God has made. Um, so, so, I, so I was a little mystified, and I remain mystified. I mean, to me, it, it's a really, this is a simple response. There, there are no theological arguments against the reality of climate change um, that anybody should listen to. Um, so end of that. Um, now, uh, I mean, also, I mean, to quote my mentor at Duke Divinity School, Stanley Hauerwas, I mean, God's promised to kill us all in the end anyway. Um, <laughs> so, so, I mean, I, I like the slide you ended with, right? Like, I mean, gosh, you know, what if we do all this and it, it turns out, what, what is it? What if we created a better world for nothing? Um, I mean, the reality is, let's hope that we do create a better world, um, not not because ultimately we get to live in it forever, because we don't, um, but because it is our obligation, as you pointed out in some of your slides, um, if to be Christian is to, to, to love and care for those things that God has made. It's that simple. And if we're not doing that, it's a mistake. Um, but I also think, um, briefly on the papal encyclical, what I, and again, Catherine really helped me with this by making this distinction between thinking about the belief in the science of climate change versus being concerned about climate change. And, and really, what the papal encyclical did was not try to convince people that climate change is real. It, it is front-loaded with the science and just a kind, of, a, a kind of devastating list of all the things that are going wrong because of climate change. But the encyclical is really, now, now that I mean, you've helped me sort of see it, what the encyclical really tried to do was, was take people like me, who you don't have to convince me that it's an issue, but like now, you should be concerned about it, <laughs> not just that it's real. That was really the work of the encyclical, and I think that's then the work, as it's, it's your, certainly your work more than mine. I mean, how do you get people to be concerned? Um, and that's hard, um, because unless it's in your backyard, we don't tend to be concerned. Um, and I think that you know the Pope made a pretty compelling case that Christians should be deeply concerned, and we should be deeply concerned mostly because of what we see it doing to the poor. Um, I mean, that's at least his starting point. And again, you know, if you live where some of us live, yeah, you know, it's just we don't see it ruining the lives of the poor. But it is beginning already to ruin the lives of the poor, and so we should be deeply concerned. Um, I'll leave it at that.